This PowerPoint is going to go through the structure and functions of the three main polysaccharides, which are starch, glycogen and cellulose. We're going to start with starch. Starch is a very large molecule. It's a polymer of alpha glucose molecules and it is joined together in two different forms. The first form is amylose. Now amylose is created by bonding the glucose to molecules together by one to four glycosidic bonds. So this means that the first ca um, carbon of one glucose molecule is bonded to the number four carbon of the next. The next slide shows us um, how that bond is created. Before we go on to that, we'll have a look at amylopectin. And amylopectin is another form of starch. And this has one to four bonds, and also it has one to six glycosidic bonds. And this creates branches. You can see where I've highlighted in yellow that this is where the, the um, branches occur, and that's where you would get the one to six bonds. Now, in both instances, the orientation of the bonds uh, between the one carbon and the one next, next to it means that the molecule actually um, spirals. It doesn't lie flat. And so this, in, in both of the molecules, it creates a very a highly coiled and compact molecule, which is very good for storage. I'm just going to show how the 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds are formed in amylose. So we've got our uh, uh, poly polysaccharide here, the amylose molecule, and we can see that we've got number 1 carbon, and it's creating a glycosidic bond with the number 4 carbon of the glucose molecule that's next to it. And this sequence is going to continue all the way along. And once you've created this chain, the chain then coils up because of the way that the bonds are orientated with one another. We look at the uh, myelopectin with the 1 to 4 bonds and also with the 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds. Um, we've got an arrow here just pointing to where the 1 to 6 bond is occurring and you can see that's number 1 carbon just there and then we've got the number 6 carbon there so we end up creating the side chains. Glycogen is very similar to amylopectin it's the storage compound for glucose in animals. And it's also made up of alpha glucose subunits with one to four link linked glucose chains, um, which are a bit shorter than the alpha starch because we get a lot more of the one to six bonds. So we end up with a, a molecule with a, l a great number of these side chains which are formed. So if we compare the structure and function of these two molecules. Now both starch and glycogen are insoluble. Now this is quite helpful because it, it won't have any impact upon the osmosis of the cell. Their hydrogen groups and the OH groups, which would normally uh, allow the molecule to form hydrogen bonds with water and therefore be soluble as they are with the monosaccharides and the disaccharides tend to be tucked away inside the coils so they don't form these hydrogen bonds and that makes them a lot less soluble in water. So starch in both the amylose and the myelopectin form very coiled structure, very compact and good for storage. Now the main benefits of amylopectin on the other hand is it has very large surface area with a large number of ends and these ends make the amylopectin very easily broken down, which therefore makes it very efficient at providing energy and releasing energy when it's required. Because the enzymes that break down the starch will only break down the end um, glucose from each chain. So the more ends you've got, the faster it can be broken down. If we look at glycogen, it's very highly branched much larger surface area in fact than even amylopectin and therefore an incredibly efficient energy store and energy release. Now starch is the compound which is stored in plants and glycogen is the one that's stored in animals and um, in both instances as we say they're not particularly soluble and in plants that may not be such a problem because plants have a cell wall and so therefore not as vulnerable to picking up too much water and co and um, lysing the cells. However, for animals, it would be very um, problematic to store large quantities of glucose in their cells. So it's turned into glycogen with 
uh, much less solubility and therefore much less imp osmotic impact upon the cells. So it doesn't lower the water potential in quite the same way as uh, the glucose would. If we go on to cellulose, Cellulose is the third polysaccharide that we really need to know something about. It's an incredibly abundant organic molecule, making up 20 to 40 percent of cell walls. It's also insoluble in water, and it's an indi indigestible material to vertebrates. However, some microorganisms are able to break down cellulose, and um, this is exploited by herbivores such as ruminants, because what they do is they tend to have a number of these microorganisms in their gut which they um, use to break down the cellulose. So for example um, in ruminants such as cows they have s a certain number of these um, cellulase secreting um, bacteria and that helps them to break down the very fibrous material that they're eating. Cellulose is an important part of cell walls and this is important because it stops the cells bursting because plants don't have any means of controlling their water levels so this is the way in which the cells um, don't um, pick up so much water that they rupture their cell membranes. However, the cell walls are permeable and that's due to the very crisscross um, arrangement of the fibrils. And so cell walls are, are a bit more like a, a wicker box that the cell cytoplasm sits in. It's best to describe cell walls as being strong and flexible. Um, I quite often see people describing them as rigid, which is not really um, a particularly accurate description of how cellulose is um, laid down. So having a look at its structure, cellulose is a polymer of beta glucose and these are straight and they're unbranched chains uh, and again they're formed by a condensation reaction. We only have the formation of one to four glycosidic bonds. So there are no side chains and we get no one to six glycosidic bonds. Now unlike in starch, the beta glucose molecules are not orientated in the same direction and they tend to alternate so that um, one molecule is rotated by 180 degrees and this removes the twists in the molecule that was created um, that creates the, the, the helix that you get in amylose and so therefore the cellulose is a straight and uncoiled polymer it lies completely flat which helps it to um, form much more um, useful fibers and this diagram shows quite nicely how starch all the glucose molecules are arranged in the same orientation but if you look at the, set the, um, the cellulose underneath you can see that um, alt alternately they are um, some are facing upwards and some are facing downwards so once you've created your long chain of beta glucose molecules so you've created your long cellulose ribbon then you can sandwich together a, a large number of these cellulose molecules. So 60 or 70 could become cross-linked and these um, are held in place by hydrogen bonds. And so this creates a polymer with a lot of mechanical strength because each of these cellulose molecules then contributes to creating this mic microfibril. And then these microfibrils are then grouped together into fibres which is really what creates the fibrous nature of the cell wall. So if we have a summary then of cellulose, you can have a look at this um, slide, it kind of covers most of the important points. 20 to 40 percent of cell walls, um, the only mo molecule made of beta glucose, which is the only one you're going to need for a AS level, but just be aware that if you really do need to know that cellulose is made of beta glucose because it is a question that turns up regularly. It's um, typically cell walls have several layers of fibres running in different directions and this increases their strength. The fibres have a high tensile strength, very similar to steel, which prevents the cell walls from bursting. Cell walls are, very, are fully permeable. However, you could get other materials such as lignin and suberin and this can be added to the plant cell walls to make them waterproof and impermeable. So for example, um, lignin is laid down in the gaps between the cellulose and this lignifies the xylem vessels and eventually it causes the in interior of these um, xylem vessels to become cut off and this then results in the cell inside dying 
and then um, becoming a hollow tube which can carry water. The glycosidic bonds that form cannot be hydrolyzed by animals because they lack the enzyme with the correct complementary shaped active site. So this means that cellulose is an indigestible material. Other polysaccharides that you may need to be very vaguely aware of are chitin, which is found in the exoskeleton of insects and in the cell walls of fungi. It's very similar to cellulose, but does have additional amine groups attached to it. Peptidoglycan, also known as murine, is found in the cell walls of bacteria and it is a combination of sugars and amino acids. When we looked at um, pro prokaryotes, we mentioned that they, they have cell walls. It's not the same as plant cell walls. However, it does have a polysaccharide within it, but it's just not the same type. These two types of materials are probably worth being aware of simply because some questions that they give you tend to um, use your understanding of polysaccharides and then try to ask you, try to put it in the context of an unfamiliar situation. So what kind of questions could you be asked? Well here's um, an example of the sort of questions that you see. Explain why glycogen makes a good storage molecule. Now what I've done is I've just picked out part of um, this question from June 2011. I haven't taken the whole question because there are other sections which are not necessarily relevant to this bit of this PowerPoint. So the answer that we would look for here, why would it make a good storage molecule? Well, the first thing is that it's insoluble. And why is that a useful thing? Well, because it, it um, won't affect the water potential or the osmosis of the cell. It can be broken down or can be hydrolyzed very easily, very quickly. And the important point here, and I've underlined it, is the, um, the marking scheme that Emphasis said that you need to make sure that it's um, that you put in the idea that this is easier or quicker than normal. So that's why glycogen is a useful compound because you can break it down a lot more quickly than if, for example, you had it arranged as something like um, amylase. There are lots of branches for the enzymes to attach, which kind of links with mark, mark point three. It's very compact and therefore you get a lot of energy for its mass. So really what we can see here with this question is is um, giving one of its um, its properties and then explaining how its property links with its job. So just make sure that you don't just s explain that um, it doesn't affect the water potential without saying that it's actually insoluble. So the last question here is cellulose is a carbohydrate molecule found in plants. Complete the table below to give three differences in the structure of glycogen and cellulose and one difference has been done for you. So they've given you here that glycogen doesn't have any hydrogen bonds, whereas cellulose does. So obviously here they're talking about hydrogen bonds um, with water, whereas cellulose is not forming hydrogen bonds with water, but it is forming hydrogen bonds with itself. So if we look at um, the other mark points th that we could have um, written about, these include that um, glycogen is made of alpha glucose, which is probably one of the first things you might think of, and that cellulose is made of beta glucose. Glycogen is branched, whereas cellulose is linear or not branched. Glycogen doesn't have any fibres or fibrils, whereas cellulose does. And um, that glycogen has 1 to 4 and 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds, whereas cellulose only has the 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds. The important point I would like to, to um, really draw your attention to here is that there is a table and they have asked you really to um, give differences between two different molecules. So it is a comparison. And therefore, whatever you say on one side, you have to give the um, counter argument to the other side. And when I've seen people do these questions before, what tends to happen is that they tend to give a list of three um, features of glycogen and then three features of cellulose. And they're not side by side, so therefore they're not direct comparisons. And even if they're correct, you won't get the marks. So it is important that you make sure that um, you write it as a comparative statement.